Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. Celso Ramon Garcia, professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Pennsylvania. It is my position that the oral contraceptives, when prescribed, used, and supervised properly, present the function for which they were designed with acceptable minimal morbidity. My name is Louis Lasagna. I'm a clinical pharmacologist from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. In my opinion, the unpleasant side effects and the very real hazards associated with the oral contraceptives are of sufficient magnitude as to constitute uh, a, a, a real deterrent to their use as a birth control technique. I am Sheldon Siegel. I'm the director of the Biomedical Division of the Population Council at the Rockefeller University in New York. I shall act as moderator of the discussion of this important and timely topic. So you told me that we are talking about contraceptives and how they affected women in Puerto Rico. Yes. I didn't know anything about this. And I'm nervous and worried. Yeah, I mean, they intentionally, they being like the media and the people at the pharmaceutical companies, intentionally didn't want us to know about this. And so I feel like it's only fairly recently that we've really been getting information on it, that we've been hearing from people who lived through the experiments. But yeah, it was pretty bad. It was pretty unethical what the, the people who invented birth control did to the women of Puerto Rico. Yeah, it's already giving me vibes of our Agent Orange series, Mm -hmm. where it's not so much somebody poisoned one person and killed someone, but more of a injustice to a large group of people. Definitely, definitely. And there won't be as much focus on toxicology. I mean, I'll describe how the hormones worked and how the hormones were dangerous, but it's really, today's another history lesson, much like the Agent Orange episode was. It begins on March 2nd, 1873, actually, in the United States with the passage of the Comstock Law. This was a set of anti-obscenity laws which made it a crime to sell or distribute contraceptives or abortions, to buy materials abroad that would be used for contraception or abortion, and to even distribute literature about contraceptives in the mail on the basis that they were immoral, indecent, obscene, lewd, or lascivious. Now, a definition of obscenity was never established, and so aside from direct discussion of contraceptives and abortion, which would be breaking this law, it could be enacted generally and vaguely to whoever needed to enact it. And Comstock was actually a person, and he liked to personally enact this law. It cracked down also on gambling, lotteries, and quackery, and I don't know that it actually did much to enforce any of that. Is quackery just like a doctor or inept medical professionals like that we kind of think about or is it something else more like snake oils because around this time was like apothecaries and patent medicines Mm -hmm. and so they were saying like drink this water with a little bit of arsenic in it and it can cure whatever and so they're trying to crack down on that but i don't really think that the comstock law was applied to that i think that they were like oh we're gonna crack down on obscenity but it was clearly just contraception and abortion that they Mm. really wanted to focus on Yeah, I had no idea this went this far back. Yeah, yeah. 
An author by the name of Ezra Haywood was arrested for writing a book, Cupid's Yokes, that said that women should have the right to control their own bodies, and he discussed birth control briefly. And so it could be that because he discussed contraception, and birth control actually wasn't even the word back then, it was contraception. So because he discussed contraception in 1877, he was found guilty of breaking the Comstock Act, but it could have just been that he was also, he had the audacity to say that women should have the right to control their own bodies just what in the patriarchy is this seriously yeah. like people are getting arrested for talking about that women should be able to control their own bodies oh it gets worse it gets worse so a libertarian named de robney mortimer bennett was ar arrested for receiving a copy of book in the mail which was breaking the comstock acts you know that you can't receive any information about contraceptives through the mail it was almost the same as like if you sent a joint through the mail they were saying that it was like basically that bad and it was an abuse of the mail system how would the person who got this literature know every single thing that the book was about? That's true, too. Like, that's not fair. The same guy was arrested in 1877 for violating the Comstock Act with blasphemy. <gasps> and that came under fire by liberals at the time who were like, whose right is it to police blasphemy? Which I totally agree with. We're obviously not to the point in history where we're fully separated from church and state, even though we try to say that. And even now, where's the separation yeah. between church and state? But who the fuck is it to say what is blasphemous and what is not? This isn't the scarlet letter, right? Right, right. By 1900, 24 states had their own version of the Comstock Act to add stricter measures to the act as each state saw fit. And we get an interesting celebrity cameo from P.T. Barnum. Of like the circus fame? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> cool. I didn't expect this. <laughs> Connecticut in particular had very strict laws, Connecticut and Massachusetts both. And P.T. Barnum was credited with contributing to the passage of the strict Connecticut laws because he was the chairman of the Temperance Committee for the house in Connecticut. I already knew that P.T. Barnum was an asshole, but it's also like he had a mistress too. And so he's one of those assholes that like had a mistress and then is like, oh, contraception. He's probably the type that if his mistress ever got pregnant, totally. then all of a sudden he is pro-choice. Totally. Totally. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the issue was abortion and contraception, but the debate really centered on abortion and contraception because it's almost like one of those things that you can't really debate around because they didn't define obscenity. Right. Mm, and so mm -hmm. the debate always centered on the First Amendment. Like, are we able to call something blasphemous? It centered on religion and it centered on free speech that I should be allowed to say obscene things because that is my First Amendment right. We're always talking around the subject and we're never really addressing contraception and abortion, which is clearly what the problem is. Now, the rest of the Western world didn't have these restrictions on birth control, so it was being developed and we knew about it. And women were finding ways around contraception and birth. And it should come as no surprise to anybody who's living now when we're trying to roll back some of the gains in contraception that we've managed to get. But whenever you outlaw something safe like contraception, you only outlaw the safe and effective forms. You don't outlaw all forms. All forms, right. And that's something that I really think that pro-lifers misunderstand. Just because you think that abortion shouldn't exist doesn't mean that people aren't going to abort babies. And the way that they're going to do it is going to be very dangerous, very unsafe for not just the fetus, but for the mother. Yeah. What is the saying? Where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Just not safe. It's not yeah. safe. I know that a lot of minds might be going to, you know, accidentally falling down the stairs and coat hangers and things like that. But Lysol discreetly advertised itself as a feminine hygiene product during this time. And at one point, ads ran that claimed that women used Lysol always for douching. Like the disinfectant that we like clean our counters with? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. But the pre-1953 formula for Lysol contained Cresol, which is a phenol compound that causes inflammation, burning, and death. And death. That's a pretty serious side effect. So the Cresol, the phenol, was eventually replaced with orthohydroxydiphenol. And then it was pushed as a germicide good for cleaning toilet bowls and treating ringworm. And the company that made the disinfected continued to market it as a safeguard for women's dainty feminine allure. So they were, they were saying, you could kill a baby with this? Is that what they were going for? It, or... I mean, you could kill a baby with it, but it was more... Like a spermis? Like, I don't... Yeah, it was more the ads were like, you'll be as clean as you were when you met <sighs> him. 
Oh, no. Yeah, it was bad. So they were pushing it as a douche, which, like, anybody who's listening and has a vagina, don't douche. Don't Don't do it. I know that it's out there, and you've probably heard to do it, but it can actually push things further up into the cervix and the uterus, and it's really bad for you. And definitely don't do it with fucking Lysol. Yeah, I mean, when I'm thinking of Lysol, like, I can smell it and think of what that is like, and thinking (gasps) about putting it in my (laughs) nethers is, like cringe tastic like yeah 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 it was so, a different time it was a different time so pre-1953 it had cresol by 1911 doctors had recorded 193 lysol poisonings and five deaths from uterine irrigation using lysol so douching using lysol that's a lot of yeah. people dead yeah So their advertising was effective, at least, because there were people out there doing this. And there was nothing else. There was nothing else at the time because birth control contraception was illegal. And so now we enter Margaret Sanger, who was a nurse from New York's Lower East Side. And she believed that people should have the children that they want and be able to control conception as easily as they can control a headache by taking an aspirin. So the story goes. I mean, this is before she really started to campaign for birth control that was hormonal or in a pill form, but she wanted contraception to be easy, which Mm -hmm. we can get on board with. She began her activism by publishing a journal called The Woman Rebel, where she coined the term birth control. So she actually came up with it and instructed women to practice it during times when it would be wise for women to avoid pregnancy, such as illness or poverty. And she didn't give instructions for how you would counter or avoid pregnancy, Mm. But she was still eventually indicted for nine violations of the Comstock Act and fled to England to continue her work there. So even though she didn't say, this is how you could do it, just wouldn't it be nice Mm -hmm. if we could control that? And they're like, yeah, that's bad. Yeah. We're going to pressure. Yes. And now before we get too far, some people are already familiar with Sanger and her work and her flaws, of which there were many. And I mostly agree that if your body is too ill to conceive or if you're not in a good financial situation to take care of a baby, that birth control is an asset. I say that to reflect how I would feel about my own personal situation and how I would choose to advocate for any other person's right to choose what they do with their body, how and when. If you want to have a baby when you're sick, maybe you're chronically ill and there's never going to be a right time and so you're just going to do it. And I'm not going to tell you one way or another, right? However... Sanger was not as forgiving in her position. When she said that the ill and the poor shouldn't have children, she meant it full stop because she was a proponent for eugenics. Big yikes. Yeah. So that's a big stretch from like avoiding getting pregnant Mm -hmm. until it's financially feasible or you're healthier. It's like there's a race component. Yes. There's Mm. there's a race component. There's a like a classist class like like she's basically saying like the poor shouldn't have babies yeah yeah okay in 1921 in an article she wrote that the most urgent problem today is how to limit and discourage the over fertility of the mentally and physically defective (sighs) yeah In the United States, eugenics intersected with the birth control movement in the 1920s, and Sanger reportedly spoke at eugenics conferences, even. She was big in the movement. She also talked about birth control being used to facilitate the process of weeding out the unfit and the preventing of the birth of defectives. In 1923, she wrote an article entitled, A Better Race Through Birth Control. Wow. And as clickbaity as it sounds to just give the title of the article and then not quote it, I'm not going to quote it because... People who I care about and people who, I, people who I don't know, even if I don't know you, you don't deserve to like be in a position where maybe you're mentally ill or you're physically handicapped or differently abled in any way. You don't need to hear these quotes that Margaret Sanger said because you already know what yeah, the sentiment from, is. From the title, that says plenty. Yeah, and like, I mean, race, obviously, like, whew. This was, wow. this was before Hitler decided to ride that pony full stop into the Holocaust, but still like it's not good stuff Mm -hmm. and i mean she wasn't alone in the eugenics movement because it was pretty popular before world war ii but like jesus christ so after all of this after world war ii mostly and singer was really being analyzed and looked at critically from a historical viewpoint people want to argue that she was trying to eliminate black babies in particular because they said that a lot of her 
clinics were in Black neighborhoods. I mean, most of the studies that have looked at where the clinics are, they're primarily in white neighborhoods, actually. And so anybody anybody who doesn't like Margaret Sanger because she was racist, yes, she was racist. She was racist, I'm yeah. not going to fight that. She was lauded by MLK Jr. in 1966 for her efforts to help the Black community because birth control and contraception does help people who are sick mm-hmm. and impoverished. Like, her efforts did help, but did they come from a place of racism? Probably. And I'm not going to argue that. I just, I want everyone to know Sanger was a really, she was a fucked up person. She was a shitty person, yeah. She was. But without her, we wouldn't have Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood has since tried to distance themselves from Sanger. But as one of my favorite podcasts says, history should make you feel weird. <laughs> <laughs> and this makes me feel real weird. Very weird. Again, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that birth control is a great choice for people when it's their choice and they're informed. The audience should take this as foreshadowing. So eventually Sanger came back to the U.S. and the charges against her for violating the Comstock Act mm-hmm. were dropped. She immediately decided to launch a new publication called the Birth Control Review. She <laughs> just can't just, help herself. No, just a huge <laughs> fuck you to the Comstock Act. That year, she opened the first birth control clinic in America in Brooklyn, and after 10 days, the clinic was raided by the Vice Squad and shut down, and Sanger was arrested. This sounds like a dystopian world. I really didn't understand how far body autonomy has come for women. Like, I already think that it's not in the greatest spot, but I didn't realize, like, oh, okay, it could be way worse. And it has been. Yeah. Yeah. In 1918, Singer was taken to court for her operation of the clinic, and it ruled that birth control should be allowed for therapeutic purposes, as in when the pregnancy could be dangerous or fatal for the pregnant person. But this only applied to New York, and so we're starting to get movement, but this is only applying to New York. In 1921, she established the Birth Control League, which was the first form of the Planned Parenthood Federation of, of America. In 1923, she was finally able to open the first legal birth control clinic in the U.S., She followed the Crane decision, which was the one saying that you could have birth control used therapeutically. Mm, mm -hmm. She mostly followed that, but eventually she challenged the Comstock Act again when she got involved with the court battle over a doctor who was ordering a shipment of Japanese diaphragms. So it wasn't like there wasn't birth control at all at this time. Oh, no. There was birth control. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. uh. Diaphragms were actually a big one in Japan in particular. And so, yeah, we were we were working on different types of contraceptive. We weren't we weren't to the point of hormonal contraception, but we were trying to find different ways. It's just that the U.S. was like, we're not going to talk about it. Ugh. Yeah, and you know how abstinence only education works. <laughs> so after she got involved in this court order with the doctor and the diaphragms, the court ruled that physicians can receive contraceptive devices and information from the mail unless one of the state laws or acts prohibits it. So again, they're saying. The states can decide, but in general, Mm. a doctor should be able to receive these. Well, that's progress. Yeah. And this led the American Medical Association to officially recognize birth control as part of a doctor's medical practice, which changed the ability to charge doctors with indecency under Comstock. They're saying that doctors are safe to do this now. Yes. Got it. Okay. So another important player who comes into the story is named Gregory Pincus. He was an assistant professor at Harvard who achieved the first ever in vitro fertilization in rabbits in 1934. However, people did not think this was great. They didn't think, oh, women can have babies when it's hard to have babies. He was accused of playing God, and then Harvard didn't grant him tenure. Different time. (laughs) Different times, yeah. (laughs) Birth control pills were being researched at this time. So they were being researched overseas, and people at universities and such were looking into them. And hormonal birth control seemed to be the future of birth control. So Gregory Pincus and another Harvard physician named John Rock, who actually argued that Massachusetts should follow New York's example to let physicians advise patients on birth control. He was very pro, like, let physicians help their patients in Mm -hmm. terms of birth control. They teamed up, and another researcher named Dr. Min Chua Cheng were acquainted with Sanger. They all knew Sanger because she was just deeply involved in anything that had to do with birth control. She was aware of their studies, which involved injecting rabbits with progesterone, and she apparently asked them personally if a pill was possible and if they could make it for a human population. So progesterone, just to give a little bit of the talks that we Mm -hmm. will delve into today, is primarily responsible for preventing pregnancy. The main mechanism of action is the prevention of ovulation. 
Another primary mechanism of action is progesterone's ability to inhibit sperm from penetrating through the cervix and upper genital tract by making the cervical mucus too thick. Mm. Yeah, so that's how it works. And so they decided, okay, we're going to just go with progesterone. They had only discovered hormones a couple years before this research, but they just went headfirst into it. They were like, progesterone, we think, is the future of birth control. This is it. We, we're we putting all of our money mm-hmm. on progesterone. And so when Sanger was like, can you make a birth control pill? They said, I think we can. Sanger and Planned Parenthood wrote them a $2,500 grant, and a pill was eventually made using only progesterone. And then they were able to begin human trial tests on volunteers in Boston, but they decided they needed a larger human population to study because they were having a hard time keeping women in the study in Boston because they were experiencing side effects, and they were having a hard time just having a study in Boston because of the laws prohibiting birth Mm. control. They actually had to say that it was a fertility study. Well, because I mean, I'm sure that they were going to have women who were like, "Uh, I don't know if I want to be on this side of the law. Like That too. Yeah. You know. This is where they... Is this where they started to be unethical? I mean, they're eugenicists. There's just a whole lot of unethical shit happening. I mean, they were on the road. Like, yeah, they were on the frontage road of unethical, like the whole time. And maybe this is where they get to the on-ramp. Yeah, they turned onto the highway. (laughs) So now the highway to being totally unethical is that During these trials, the people in the trials were not told what the study was for because they were told it was a fertility study, which is unethical. And they did justify it by like, oh, women who go on the pill, when they come off of it, there's an increase in their fertility from what it was before. Cool. Fine. Interesting side effect. That's not what you're researching. (laughs) Right. And then they actually didn't tell them what the drugs could do. They didn't tell them about any possible side effects. And in the 1950s, there was no law requiring physicians to inform their patients that they were being included in an experiment or what the drugs would do. There were no laws about informed consent whatsoever. And since there's no laws, I mean, why would we do that? Why would anybody have a conscience and, I don't know, be upfront with your patient? So what they were told, aside from the fertility study, you'll be more fertile afterwards, was that the progesterone would shut down their ovaries. It would be impossible to get pregnant for a while. They might experience nausea, and then they'd have a better chance of getting pregnant after the the study was complete. But 15% of the women showed signs of ovulation while taking the progesterone. And so they were having women drop out of the study. The progesterone wasn't even showing to be effective. It was not going well. But they still wanted, wanted a larger population, which... I mean, if you're working in a small population, you do need a larger population. I mean, you need a larger sample size will help you get a better idea because maybe that 15% that were having those issues, they had something in common. But if we had a bigger sample size, maybe this isn't as big of a problem. Yeah, or you could find what was in common. Are those 15% mm-hmm. smokers or something like something, that? Something, right, right. In 1954, Pincus and his wife visited Puerto Rico where he was giving lectures at medical schools. And while there, he learned that the island already had 67 operating birth control clinics because birth control had been lit- legal in Puerto Rico since 1937. Now, poverty and overpopulation were problems on the island, and so they could have taken a very humanitarian approach to this had they been ethical. But mm. they didn't need to be, and so they weren't. So the conditions on the island were as such. The average Puerto Rican mother had given birth to 6.8 children by age 55. And while birth control was legal, about 8% of the population had opted for sterilization before they were 50 years old because abortions were illegal. Just because abortions were illegal doesn't mean that they didn't happen. And so Puerto Rican people were in this position where... They couldn't get birth control, they would get pregnant, and then they'd get these sketchy abortions. And people actually flew to Puerto Rico to get abortions because it became known as a place where you could easily get an abortion. And so maybe this was more effective. They didn't really want to take birth control because Puerto Rico is a very Catholic place. And so it was seen as a Mm. sin from God to try to control it. But if you were sterilized, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but the sterilizations were exactly voluntary either. I've seen a couple papers that are actually kind of recent that were like, oh, the sterilization, the rate of hysterectomies, that is, of people in Puerto Rico is interestingly high. And it's like, well, it's high because they were influenced to get hysterectomies. So now Pincus's contact in Puerto Rico for the trials he decided to conduct there was a woman named Dr. Idris Rice Ray, who was a medical director from Detroit. So you got all these white people coming into Puerto Rico. <laughs> we're going to stop these babies, goddammit. Uh... 
<laughs> yeah, it's gross. Simultaneously, Pinkus also got approval to experiment on patients at the Worcester State Hospital, which was an asylum over a century old in the United States. They experimented on 16 women and 16 men who were deemed psychotic. And this was only because of comparison. They weren't trying to create male birth control. They just wanted a comparison. Mm. The fucked up thing about this is that the male side of the study had varying side effects, and soon the study was discontinued. So I want people to remember that. The male side of this study on 16 men was discontinued because of negative side effects. Just keep that in mind. In 1955, Pincus decided to enroll the nurses and the medical students in Puerto Rico in the study as part of their studies, so he made it mandatory for them to do it. And he didn't want them to fear the stigma or the side effects of birth control, and so he told them that it was a study of the physiology of progesterone in women. Why not just tell the truth? Why not just say, hey guys, we're wanting to test out some birth control. I'm sure that these medical students weren't thinking, you know what would be really great right now? Getting knocked up. <laughs> That's what I'd love to come in between me and my studies. Why not just tell the fucking truth? Yeah, and if you can't get a group there, maybe people Maybe there's a reason. Yeah. By 1956, the students and the nurses had all quit. All 100 of them had quit. And Pincus and Riceway met, and Riceway decided to use her position as the director of the training center for nurses at the Department of Health's public health unit in a particularly poverty-stricken part of San Juan to obtain a list of residents from the housing development. So she took this list, she enlisted a nurse to help her who was familiar with the community, and the Puerto Rican government approved the study. So she had all of this complicitness. She had all these people who knew what was happening behind the scenes, and they were essentially, they were persuading these women under false pretenses to join the study. And they weren't told it was a study. They weren't told that it was experimental. They were just like, would you like to alleviate the burden of babies that you, can't control, that you can't control? Would you like to be on birth control? If I were one of those women thinking, like, there's this nurse and there's these people that are coming to talk to me, mm -hmm. I'm going to think this is safe because why wouldn't it be? Yeah. Why would I assume that I'm a test subject? Your brain doesn't immediately go there. Again, no informed consent. And people have likened the experiments done on the women of Puerto Rico to the experiments done on the black men in the Tuskegee syphilis study. That also had a nurse who was essentially gaining the trust of the men in the study and leading them to believe that different things were going on than they actually were. And so that's what the nurses and the government being involved feels very much like. And I, I totally understand the comparison that people make when they say that. So they chose a group of 100 women from this list in this housing development, and they also chose a, a control group of 125 women. The experimental group was told that they were receiving a novel contraceptive not that they were in a study, and the control group was told that they were just in a survey about family size. The compound mm. that they were using in the birth control group was one called norethanodril, which is a compound developed by the GT Serral Company, who funded Pincus's initial trials, but pulled out in Boston because they didn't want to be associated with illegal <laughs> contraceptive work. But they were Imagine. totally fine with giving these Puerto Rican women this <laughs> compound. Now, Pincus and Chang both preferred the norethanodril from the serial company compared to other available compounds because it produced fewer masculine traits in female test animals. Do we know what these quote-unquote masculine traits were in the no animals? Idea. I have no idea. I mean, they might still be some of the side effects that you see now from progesterone-only pills, but I don't know. Okay. The test women were directed to take a pill a day for 20 days, which was a bottle's worth, and then they were told to stop for five days and then resume their next bottle. And of course, mistakes were made. One person took the whole bottle at once, others shared their pills with friends, and the doctors and nurses, they tried handing out calendars, they tried giving women string necklaces to help them remember, but nothing was helping these women remember to take their pill every day, which was fairly new. We didn't really have medications that you needed to take every day that weren't mm. administered by the physicians back then. This is a tale as old as time. Anybody who's been on birth control, when you start, you know, you end up setting an alarm, you have to mm -hmm. set a time and remember, and then they started putting the sugar pills in because it's literally too much for us to comprehend. <laughs> you need to stop taking this for seven days yeah okay i stopped on friday so when's the way to start yeah and then you get to the next day and you're like did i 
take it. And then you have to count all of your pills. Yeah, I I totally understand how mistakes were made. It makes sense. It makes sense. We all remember the struggle. So a newspaper soon heard about the study and reported on it, calling the projects and its sponsors guilty of conducting a neo-Malthusian campaign, which is such a sick burn. (laughs) Neo-Malthusian is the advocacy of human population planning to ensure resources and environmental integrities for current and future populations, as well as for other species. But Mm. they were saying it to be like, you want white people to have the resources. Mm -hmm. And a local doctor began telling her patients that the pill was dangerous, which it was. <laughs> well, yeah. So did people listen? Yes. Following this, 30 women dropped out of the trial. And after six months, another 48 had quit. We got like 22 people left at this point. That's like nothing. Yeah. There's like nobody left. But yeah. people had caught on to what they were doing. They had caught on to the fact that there were free birth control being given out. And so by the end of 1956, 221 women participated in the trial. 17 of these women had gotten pregnant. And Pincus, because he's an asshole, he blamed them for their inability to follow dosing instructions. They didn't get pregnant because the pill was ineffective. They got pregnant because they couldn't follow when to take the pill. Yeah, I mean, that's not a small amount of people. No, no. To be fair... Oh, I don't really want to be fair to Pincus, but women had stopped taking the pills as instructed because of the terrible side effects they were experiencing. Well, yeah, and who could blame them? I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, I felt perfectly fine until this thing was introduced into my life. Yeah. And now I feel like shit all the time. Why would you keep taking it, especially if you don't even understand the purpose of you taking it? Right. And it could be one of those things where like, well... We didn't know that you have to take it within 24 hours at the same time every day. Like, we weren't up to the point that we have now. They were probably like, I can skip one because I'm super nauseous today, and I'll just pick Mm -hmm. it up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So 17% of the people reported negative reactions, and at least 25 of the 221 withdrew from the study because of the negative side effects, which included nausea, dizziness, headaches, bloating, blood clots, depression, stomach pain, and vomiting. Not a great time. The reactions were so serious and sustained that Rice Way told Pincus that a 10 milligram dose of this pill caused too many reactions to be generally acceptable. And this was the dose that Pincus had come to through animal studies and the only dose that he had ever administered in any of his trials when he should have lowered it in Boston because the women were complaining of side effects. But he insisted that the 10 milligram dose was the way to go. Let's not forget. It was not good enough for the 16 men participating in the study. We're just going to pull them out of it because, God forbid. He was convinced that the pill worked safely. And Searle had already started patenting the pills under the name Enovid. They were willing to go forward with the 10 milligram dose. They were like, 10 milligrams is fine. It's fine. But they still needed more women for the FDA clearance. And so at the same time that he's like, we don't need to be doing any more research on different dosages. They're also still needing more people for FDA clearance. And it's like, your study is falling apart before it starts, dude. Seriously. Pincus wanted to prove that the side effects were purely psychosomatic. Any female listener is going to be hearing this and being like, oh, it's all in my head, is it? Right. What's the word? Oh, hysterical. Mm, Like, mm, yeah, yeah. This message has not changed over time. So he came up with a new experiment and he gave one group of women pills and then warned them of the side effects. He gave another group a placebo and then warned them of the side effects of the pill. And then a third group was given the pill and not warned about the side effects, which totally another ethical violation. But his results convinced them that he was right. And these side effects were entirely psychosomatic, and so the subjects were simply unreliable. So a 10 milligram dose, though, was causing these side effects because in rabbits, the LD50 for progesterone is 26.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight, and that's administered orally. Obviously, the rats that were in Pincus's original study had a different reaction than humans in the 1950s, which is why they were experiencing more pregnancies than they were seeing in the rabbits and things like that. This 26.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight is approximately equivalent to about 3.9 grams of progesterone. So we should be able to take like a lot of progesterone based on these rabbit studies. But current progesterone-only pills that are still capable of causing blood clots 
and these are called the mini pill. The mini pill is the one that's progestin only. Mm. Only contains 0.35 to 5 milligrams of progesterone. He was using way too much progesterone. Yeah, that's a big difference. But yeah, just double it up for, you know, good measure. Because that's what worked in rabbits. And these women are just unreliable. Anyhow, so he still needs more test subjects for his original study and not the one where he's just proving that women are hysterical. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He contacted Clarence Gamble of Procter & Gamble fame. Now, Gamble had been funding research in Puerto Rico for years and ran many of the birth control clinics. But again, Gamble did this because he was a staunch eugenicist who believed that Puerto Ricans and others living in poverty should be wiped out to make room for fit white babies. Gamble used his clinic to encourage Puerto Rican women to undergo sterilization and led to the sterilization of a third of the women, many involuntarily after the birth of their second child. Why are we letting all of these people decide what can happen to my body? Like, who the fuck is Procter & Gamble? And why do they get to decide what I can do and not do with my body? Between pressure from the government, the Catholic Church, and Procter & Gamble, that's the reason that so many women were like, hell yeah, I'll take birth control. I don't want to have a hysterectomy after my second kid. These are three outfits that I would like to stay far away from my body (laughs) autonomy. (laughs) Right? In my opinion, this is for me. I can't even believe Procter & Gamble is still a company. It's crazy. So he gets Gamble on board. And he's able to choose from a really large pool of women now because now he has the women who are going to Gamble's clinics and they can tell them, you don't need to get a hysterectomy because there's this hormonal birth control. But even worse than that, even worse than just like a sign on the door that was like, hey, here's an option. They went door to door in Humakia, which is another poverty stricken region, to ask women how many children they had, if they were sterilized what birth control they were using, and then he got women to volunteer to start on the birth control without telling them that it was an experiment or telling them about the negative side effects. This is not okay. No! Like, in any way, shape, or form, like, this isn't going door-to-door selling knives or selling (laughs) fucking Avon. Which, even that is like, please stop. Please stop. But also, like, I would much rather have the Avon lady or the the weird knife guy show up to my house. Honestly, I mean, for some of these women, it probably sounded like a good idea. So, of course, they're going to jump on it. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, that's, that is not okay. So now they had two studies in Puerto Rico. They had Humacao and San Juan, and then Pinka started a third study in Port Al Prince, Haiti. Do we know how many people were involved in these studies? The studies lasted a fairly long time. I don't know how many stu- how many women they got through going door to door and all that. Mm-hmm. But after everything is said and done, they had about 1,500 women who were involved. Damn. At some point during the 1956 studies, Pincus and Chain discovered that the progesterone pills, Enovid, which were being manufactured by a Searle, had been contaminated with some estrogen, which Pincus always wanted to avoid because he thought it was unsafe and he thought it was likely responsible for any possible negative side effects. <laughs> After the contaminated drugs were removed from the studies, though, the side effects got worse and included a greater chance of subjects experiencing breakthrough bleeding. So Pincus decided more experiments were needed, which obviously more experiments are needed, dude. Like, <laughs> start your study over and do it right yeah yeah let's just seriously just throw it all out and start over at this point but now he decided to start including synthetic estrogen in the pill formulation he found that breakthrough bleeding decreased as estrogen increased but nausea and breast pain increased as it also increased he discovered that the pills with less estrogen were less effective at preventing pregnancy And so he decided to direct Searle to reformulate the 10 milligram tablets with 1.5% mestrinol. And the side effects didn't cease, but the bleeding stopped. And is mestrinol different than, is it like a synthetic estrogen? It's a synthetic estrogen. Got it. This was eventually what went to market. And since oral contraceptives were first released onto the market, the estrogen dose has been reduced in the pills. Early preparation contained 150 milligrams of mestronol or ethanol estradiol. We use estradiol today. That might sound familiar. That's usually the synthetic estrogen that Mm. we use. And so this combination of progesterone and estrogen, I think, is the common pill that we're familiar with, not the mini pill, but just the regular Mm -hmm. pill. And nowadays, 
the preparations contain 50 or 30 milligrams of estradiol or ethanol estradiol. So even much less estrogen is being mm-hmm. like, they're, we're just pumping these women full of hormones and not really knowing what we're doing. So the absolute risk of venous thrombosis in women of reproductive age is less than one per 10,000 per year. In oral contraceptive users, it becomes two to three per 10,000 per year. So for some people, this is so low that they accept them. But the risk of having a blood clot increased as the estrogen was increased in the pills. So the progesterone Mm. pills, they had a chance of blood clots in them, but it's less than the estrogen. And so now they're Mm. starting to introduce this estrogen, which increases your chance of this venous thrombosis. And it's just, they didn't know anything about what they were giving to these women. And so they could have these blood clots and it could be fatal. And three women died in the study. And did they make adjustments or did they probably just figure that it was grist for the mill? No, they didn't change anything. In fact, after the women died, they didn't even do autopsies on them. And so it could never be proved that their deaths were caused by the study. That's fucking outrageous. I know. I know. So beginning in 1957, Pincus was frustrated that he didn't have enough subjects for FDA clearance. And so in another morally questionable decision, he decided to stop reporting on people, which he had 130 of, and decided to only report on observed menstrual cycles. And so he was able to boost his numbers from 130 to 1,279 and say, we didn't see a single pregnancy. So he was counting the menstrual cycles Like, so if he studied a woman for six months, let's say she had six periods, Mm -hmm. instead of saying this was one woman, this was six. Yes. This was six observed cycles. I don't know that he was changing like, oh, I was looking at six people, but he was like, look at how great my numbers are and there's no pregnancies. And it's like, you're only looking at 130 women and saying that there's no pregnancy. Yeah, that's not okay. So Cyril faced some difficult questions. They were asking... What were the rules for testing the pills in healthy people? Was everybody who was given the pill in Puerto Rico healthy? How far did the company have to go to prove such a product? Was one year of testing enough? Because they'd only been looking at it for a year in 100, 221 people with 130 people that they could report on, right? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. But Pincus was like, don't worry. To the head of the company, he was like, don't worry about it. And In the end, there was no way to answer questions like this because no one had ever done anything like this. And so they were like, you know, we're we're pioneers, and so don't even worry about it. And it was going to make money. Everybody just wants to get their money. Gold shiny coin. Yep. Yeah. Cyril decided to push through, and they knew that they couldn't ask for FDA approval on birth control because that would be too controversial. And so instead, they asked for approval of a drug for the treatment of menstrual disorders. And in the 1957 application, the company made absolutely no reference to contraception, which means that the FDA couldn't reject them on the basis for being a safe and effective contraceptive. Because it's kind of like an off-label moment. Yes. So do we know what type of menstrual disorders he was trying to say that this treated to get the backdoor Mm -hmm. FDA approval? He was saying that it treated amenorrhea, which is the absence of menses, dysmenorrhea, which is painful cramping at menses, and menorrhagia, which is menstrual bleeding for longer than seven days. Okay. Which I think it actually did help women with this when it wasn't killing them and making them really nauseous. After two months, the FDA approved Enovid for infertility and menstrual disorders, and on June 10th, 1957, it was first listed available on the market. A side effect was listed that the drug prevented ovulation, and people quickly caught on to what this off-label use meant. Mm -hmm. So no one needed a prescription from their doctor for Enovid, and in the 17 states that still banned the sale, distribution, or advertisements of contraception in 1958, Enovid was perfectly legal. Mm. Now, the distribution of Enovid without a physician's instructions led to the same issues in dosing that it had in Puerto Rico. They had to eventually print a brochure for family planning that was prepared for Enovid because they were just giving them a bottle and they were saying, take one every day, stop for five days, and then take your next bottle. And people were not following directions. And then still getting pregnant. It was hard. We already talked about how this is hard. And it was just being, it was just a bottle. They didn't even come out with the the calendar thing. That was a patent thing that came out in like the 60s or the 70s when they were like, oh, this is a really good idea. This makes it a lot. 
It's a game changer. We all know it. We love to see it. So, Searle asked for FDA approval of Enovid in 1959 as a contraceptive and submitted the largest drug application in history at the time. So, this would have needed a lot of eyes on it, and it would have needed to basically be gone over with a fine-tooth comb. Unfortunately, the FDA was miserably understaffed, and rather than going to a full-time investigator, the application went to a part-timer named Pasquale de Felice, who was a Catholic OBGYN who was still in his residency. So he was not even a doctor. No, no, he was still in his residency. He wanted more than 130 subjects to be studied, which is totally fair. That's totally fair. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they decided that, okay, 130 subjects isn't enough, but we did a survey of these 61 physicians in the United States, and they were overwhelmingly in favor of Enovid as a birth control. So why don't we just go ahead and start using it as an on-label method? Oh, no. Mm-hmm. It, but if they wanted more data for safety and efficacy, they could have had it because the studies in Puerto Rico lasted until 1964. It lasted well after Enovid was first marketed. Well, and there were people who would have signed up for that study had they have asked. Yeah. I mean, especially since it was like this overwhelming thing where everybody was like, oh, have you heard of this Enovid pill and what it can do? Like, they didn't need to keep studying Puerto Rican women who didn't realize that they were in a study and they yeah. never were given lower or safer doses and never given full disclosure. I don't <sighs> know how much I can restate that. Like so many ethical violations. And if it was officially released as the first hormonal contraceptive on May 9th, 1960. And so they're still testing on the Puerto Rican women who don't know that they're being tested on yes. and they didn't test anybody in the U.S., it and, sounds like. I mean, it gets even kind of more fucked up because in 1961, the thalidomide scandal broke out. And thalidomide is something that we're going to, we are planning to cover next season. But in short, there was a pill that was being used for morning sickness and everywhere else in the world was using it. But the FDA application was rejected in the United States because one really, really... Mm, just lovely FDA doctor was like, you don't have enough here. I want to see more. I don't trust this study. And so she rejected their application. And then it was found that it was causing massive birth defects. Oh, like, shit. yeah. And so people were scared. They were like, oh, we just came really close to being a part of this scandal and having major birth defects in the United States. Mm -hmm. And we just narrowly avoided it by having FDA standards that are still kind of like loosey-goosey. And so the human tests became stricter. But we still were testing on the Puerto Rican women for another three years following the scandal. It's not even one of those things where it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know I couldn't do that. No. Like, I didn't know that this was bad. Like, no, this was talked about for a different reason why this is an issue and why we should not do that. Even if you can't get ethics into your head, your science is bad. Your study is bad. It is right. designed badly. Right. The first blood clot and a woman in the United States was reported in 1961 when a nurse developed a pulmonary embolism shortly after starting an oral contraceptive containing 100 milligrams of estrogen. Oh my gosh. And she was she was receiving this for endometriosis. Like I feel so bad That's, for this woman. That's well yeah because that feeds the endometriosis. Yeah. I feel terrible for this woman. And then another stroke was reported in 1962, uh, a myocardial infarction, so a heart attack was reported in 1963. And for a long time, no one believed that estrogens being used as a postmenopausal hormonal replacement had any effect on blood clots. But clearly, and I mean, like, you, you didn't need these women to, to suffer like this because right. we already had three deaths. Data, yeah. From the tests that they were doing in Puerto Rico, like, they knew about this. This stinks just like the Agent Orange, mm -hmm. shit where it's like, we knew there was a problem, but we are just going to pretend there's not mm -hmm. and keep going with it because yeah. we're going to make a lot of money. So that's yeah. pretty cool, right? Searle received reports of 132 blood clots, including 11 deaths by 1962. So before that last myocardial infarction that we mentioned. But the company declared that there was no conclusive evidence to demonstrate that blood clots were a direct result of the pill. So the FDA knows, Searle knows, and they still say, this is fine. This is safe. This is so messed up. 
1964, they finally did release a, a pill, an Enovid E, that was a reduced dosage. So it was 2.5 milligrams of progesterone, and it also had a lower amount of estrogen. In 1965, birth control was still illegal in Connecticut. <laughs> and so there was a major Supreme Court battle. Estelle Griswold and Lee Buxton went to Connecticut, and they took their case to the Supreme Court. And the court struck down the Connecticut law, which prohibited the use of birth control as a violation of a couple's right to pregnancy. So it repealed the Comstock Act, but it only mm. it only made birth control legal for married couples, which is pretty invasive still, I think. I, I wonder if they really are just going off the notion of like people don't have premarital sex. So this isn't a problem for the singles. It doesn't make sense to me, but I could see the mental gymnastics for them to arrive mm -hmm. there. Yeah. But that's still yeah. so like, oh, let me bring in my marriage certificate to show that I can get birth control, please. Right. Because now that I'm a married woman, I will be having relations. I mean, it's me like, this, it's in the same vein as like you can get abor an abortion if your husband signs off, you know? Yeah. So by 1970, the pill was being linked to more strokes, more heart attacks, and more blood clotting, which led to congressional hearings about the birth control pill. The Washington-based Women's Liberation Group issued a statement saying, in spite of the fact that it is women who are taking the pill and taking the risks, it was legislatures, the doctors, and the drug company's representatives, all men of course, who were testifying and dissecting women as if they were no more important than the laboratory animals they work with every day. And I think that's astute because that's how they were treating women from the beginning, like we were just mm -hmm. rabbits. I mean, the only the only decency that was shown throughout all of it was when the men complained of symptoms. Mm -hmm. Because when the women complained of symptoms, then it turned into, we have to do a whole other study, not to try to get rid of the symptoms, but to prove that you are a crazy woman and you're full of shit. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a man. I'm a doctor. How could yeah. I be wrong? I'm a doctor. I've been studying rabbits. And it's like, is a rabbit a woman? Right. I mean, at least people are finally arriving here. It wasn't until 1972. My mom was born already. Mine too. 1972, that the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Eisenstadt versus Baird that a state cannot stand in the way of distributing birth control to a single person, and that finally struck down the Massachusetts law prohibiting the sale of contraceptives to unmarried women. 1972! That's what I was just going to say. 1972. I listen to music older than that. I know. Like, that's crazy to think that, like, I listen to music on the regular that's older than women being able to get birth control on their mm -hmm. own. So, from a 2012 article from the College of Family Physicians of Canada, I found a quote saying, Despite the substantial positive effect of the pill, its history is marked by a lack of consent, a lack of full disclosure, a lack of true informed choice, and a lack of clinically relevant research regarding risk which I think is a pretty good way to sum up how we got here. That's a perfect summation. Now, things haven't gotten a whole lot better with the pill. We have improved toxicity studies on estrogen and progesterone since the pill was released. We know what the lowest dose of toxicity for estrogen is. We don't know what an LD50 is in a human because human studies are unethical to take to fatal toxicity levels. But... We have a little bit better of an idea. And still, birth control is kind of dangerous. So people are still at risk of clotting, including people with high blood pressure or migraines. And they're often advised to not take any estrogen-containing form of birth control. Side effects of the mini pill, which just contain progesterone, include irregular bleeding or spotting, headache, breast pain, stomach pain, bloating, nausea, vomiting, hair loss, depressed mood. I feel like I'm reading the fine print at the end of an advertisement. Like, there's mm -hmm. so much that can happen. And then you can end up with missed menstrual periods, pelvic pain, increased thirst, loss of appetite. The mini pills are safer for people over 35, smokers, people with high blood pressure, and people with a history of blood clots, but it's not completely safe. And then if you are taking one of the pills that has estrogen, you're at increased risk for blood clots. You're at increased risk for anxiety, breakthrough bleeding, changes in periods, depression, dry mouth, thirst, fainting, headaches, 
high blood pressure, muscle cramps, nausea, loss of hair again, skin irritation, stomach upset, vaginal discharge and discomfort, and weight changes. I'm just picking from a, a long like, list. Like, there are more than Kayla mentioned yeah. on this list. And it's like, I mean, when you open up in the birth control, when oh, you open it up, it's huge. It's such like, a read. And yeah. the print is so, 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 so tiny. Yeah. Yeah, and they had and, to, like, fight to have that put in so that people understood the risk. Really? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole, like, process of getting the, the pills with the circles or the calendar mm -hmm. that we have in the insert, that was a whole thing. They just wanted to give us a bottle of pills and send us on our way. And not tell us about any of these issues that yeah. could be life-threatening mm -hmm. for some of them. Mm -hmm. And if it, like, starts making you depressed or anxious... Yeah, that's something you've got to. I mean, and if you're not in tune with yourself and you think like, yeah. oh man, am I just like going through it? Yeah, but it could be because of hormones that you're taking. Like, yeah, those are things that you need to talk about. And I wish that these are things that doctors would discuss with you because I was given no information mm -hmm. about this. I started taking it for acne in high school and. I had no idea until I looked at the pamphlet, but I mean, I was like 14. I didn't read that pamphlet. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. like, I was just like, okay, I figure I got to take this every day sort of at the same time. Like, mm -hmm. we, this isn't discussed even now. I mean, no. maybe now this was like, I don't know, 20 don't years know. ago for me now. But I thought about it while I was researching this because I was going to do a microdose about the history of contraceptives after this because that's it's really it is interesting. We've had contraceptives for forever. So the notion that like in 1873, we're like, no, no contraceptives. It's like, that's ridiculous. But after a lot of the information I was finding, I feel like we need to do a microdose on modern contraceptives and the dangers that are presented with modern contraceptives because I mean, people are advocating for you shouldn't need a prescription to get birth control. And I I think that you still need a physician to be able to advise you on it. I don't think you should just right. be able to go and pick up birth control the same way that you can go and pick up DayQuil, you know, which even DayQuil, don't you need to show your ID for that? I think now, and it's not that it's a matter of ease to get it, because do I think that it should be easy mm -hmm. to get? Yes. But does yeah. a physician need to be involved? I think so, because this is serious shit. Yeah, yeah. And there there are pros and cons to the different types. And oh, oral that's... contraceptives are a fraction of what's yeah. available now. So, yeah. And so to talk it out with a doctor is a pretty good idea of what's right for you. Even if you're a young person or, or an older person who's like, I'm going to change my birth control or, you know, I, I'm now deciding to be sexually active. I'm not going to like diss on anybody's life choices. But if you're looking at one of those mm -hmm. charts that they have on the internet, that's like there's condoms and there's internal condoms and then there's the ring and the patch. Like that is just like you can go to that and decide, I want to do the patch, I guess. And then there's so many patches to choose from. Right. There's right. just so many. And what I think is, I guess it's interesting. It makes me kind of angry, but Recently, the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine was halted for a while because of the reports of blood mm -hmm. clots. And the chances of getting a blood clot on Johnson & Johnson with the reported numbers that we have so far are less than one in a million because there have been six reports, reports, there could be more, mm -hmm. of blood clots in 6.8 million administered vaccines. That's compared to the odds of getting a blood clot from birth control if it's in a pill, a ring, or a patch, if it has estrogen, your chances are 3 to 9 in 10,000. Yeah. My first thought when I heard about the Johnson & Johnson being paused, I was like, you have a better chance of getting a blood clot from birth control you than do. you do from that vaccine. Mm -hmm. And they haven't halted birth control. Yeah. Like, yeah. I get erring on the side of caution. Totally. totally. But when you look at those numbers, it's pretty pretty big difference. And I know that like my partner, he didn't know that because why would he know what the yeah. rates of blood clots are for women on birth control? Yeah. You know, so yeah. maybe it's not common knowledge, but it was the first thing I thought of. Like, it was the first thing I thought of too. And I mean, they are different types of blood clots that we're talking about. I think with birth control, it's deep vein thrombosis and that you can be given heparin. But it's also like, I don't know, how do you find the blood clot? Like, how do you even know you have the blood clot until you like, is it going to become a stroke? Yeah. Right. Whereas with Johnson and Johnson, I guess it can't be treated or prevented with heparin. And so 
sure, that needs to be taken into a risk benefit analysis. But it's also like, maybe we should just kind of overhaul what we're doing with hormones. If we're saying that Johnson and Johnson kind of scares me with a six and 6.8 million statistic. Right. That's what I'm saying. Maybe the white men at the top, they're all (laughs) at the big fancy desk. Like, hey guys, remember how this was a really big deal? Yeah. Got something for you to show you that this is going to blow your socks off. Yeah. And you're just going to listen because we're going to bring in a group of people who have uteruses and we're going to talk <laughs> and you're not. Okay. <laughs> God. All right. So yeah, everybody be on the lookout for a microdose about more modern birth control, because I think that is definitely in the works after all my research for this. This episode was scary in a different way, not in the normal way that I leave the episodes feeling a little frightened or on edge or thinking (laughs) about my everyday life in a different way. But I really had no idea that the women of Puerto Rico were treated like this. And this wasn't even that long ago. No, no. I mean, there's, there's people who their grandmothers probably were part of this experiment, you know, and it was 1500 women in Puerto Rico. And we didn't even talk about Haiti, but I'm sure the people in ha- the people in Haiti weren't given any more information or any sort um, of informed consent either. And it's just, I would be surprised. Yeah. Recapping on the whole thing, like, do I support Planned Parenthood? Yes, I do. Do I support Margaret Sanger? Mm-hmm. Mm, no, <laughs> I can't say that I do. <laughs> yeah, I I had never heard of her before this, and I mean anybody who's racist, bye. We aren't going any further. Like, yeah. You're like, trash. thanks for coming up with the term birth control. And like, I don't know if we're beyond you now. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Well, I look forward to learning more about the contraceptives that we have today. This started from the bottom and fucked up proceed to now we here? Question mark? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where exactly is that? Uh, yeah. Where are we? It doesn't sound great, but a little better. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. But yeah. So that's a good note to end on because if anybody wants to keep hearing about birth control or any other poisons, this is the last episode for season one. Round of applause. We made it. We we did it. But yeah, if you want to keep hanging out with us over the summer, you're going to have to head on over to our Patreon because we'll continue to do monthly episodes over there until we resume in September. Yes. So if $2 is in your budget and Mm -hmm. you have learned from Kayla's vast, expanse knowledge about all the things talks related consider donating to us on Patreon so you can help support our dream. Yeah, we'd like to hang out with you. Yeah, and we're doing movie nights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This summer. So mm-hmm. That'll be cool. And while we are on it, I just want to give a shout out to all of our current patrons for joining us before the summer. And there's still a chance for everybody else to join us the day that this episode is released we will be announcing who the winner of a year-long patreon membership is if you don't win it's still only two dollars and we'd love for you to join us over there and you can join joshua izzy the jamie bear key patrick and venus over on our patreon and hang out and see exclusive microdose videos and be part Mm -hmm. of polls it's good stuff Yeah. Thank you all for supporting us. This is like, like just over like a year and a half ago, we were, this was a baby idea that we had (laughs) at our journal night. Here we are. And it's seriously really humbling. And I get all the feels when I think about people listening and all the support. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all so much. It's been a blast hanging out with you. It's been a blast telling you guys all about the weird toxins I know about, and I can't wait to do it again next season. I'm ready. And (laughs) I'm scared and excited, per usual. Good, good. I hope everybody else is too. (laughs) Well, I hope, if you're not going to check us out over on Patreon, I hope that you have a beautiful summer. Stay safe. Get the vax when you can. Hot back summer. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. 
for an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe and remember, the dose makes the poison. Thank you.